Thank you very much. Okay. Man of Integrity was uh, the product of a vision that God has given me. It started when I was still with Promise Keepers in Manila. It's Promise Keepers is a movement that started in the U.S. And uh, during that time, at the height of the Promise Keepers and, uh, uh, you know, popularity, it really took America by storm because so many men's lives were transformed by that movement. Uh, men became more faithful to their wives. Men became closer to their sons and their children. And so there was a radical change in many men in America. In fact, CNN uh, st stated that uh, it took America by storm. But somehow, somewhere down the years, uh, there are many difficulties that took place. And so when I was part of a, uh, a movement in Manila, started by Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches under Bishop F. Tendero, I was together with my... Uh, who was a former church member, also became the founder of Promise Keepers Philippines. We worked together, together with Bishop F. Tendero, and we traveled around the Philippines conducting seminars for men. And our desire is to help uh, mentor men because most of us grew up in homes where most of us did not have a very good uh, uh, model from our fathers, okay? Because, you know, all these uh, influences uh, are transmitted generationally. And many men struggle with their marriages, with their uh, relationships in the family because uh, sometimes they just don't know how to be effective as a husband and a father. And that's why this movement started because we believe that the redemption of society begins with the redemption of men. Because as men, we are leaders of our families, leaders in our different capacities in society. And we know that when our lives are transformed, the world around us is going to be affected. As I shared last time, you know, many major changes in history began with a man. A man with a passion and a vision and with a commitment to see that vision realized. And we know that this man in the different fields of the sciences and the arts really made an impact in history and a number of them actually moved civilization forward because they were faithful to the vision that God gave them in order to help humanity. And so I believe it takes just one man to make a big difference wherever you are. We were designed by God that way. Not all uh, leaders are men, but according to the Bible that reveals to us the design of God for men, all men were meant to be leaders, especially in our families. That's where the leadership is first honed and molded. And so tonight, we're going to talk about a very important relationship that all of we have, and for those who are single, you will soon have, or maybe you're already having it with your, uh, you know, girlfriend, okay, and probably contemplating marriage in the near future, okay. I remember, you know, uh, an appointment I had in Cebu, I spoke in a, Christ in a Chinese church, and uh, I spoke about marriage. And after the service, the uh, elders came to me and started to thank me for the message. You know, glory to God. And I met the chairman of the Board of Elders of the Chinese Church. He's a very tall man, uh, a very accomplished businessman. And he came to me and said, you know, Pastor Dave, I thank you for the message. It has really enlightened me a lot. Uh, but I have some concern I'd like to share with you. And I said, sure, you can share. And I said, you know, Pastor, there's only one thing in my whole life I cannot really understand. And he said, please go on. It's my wife. <laughs> and then he said that his wife was behind him, and uh, the wife just, you know, giggled a little. <laughs> she was also, of course, in the senior years. And I look at his eyes and I said, well, sir, uh, modesty aside and no offense, I think your wife may be saying the same thing about you. Okay? Because it takes two to tango. And he said, I really want to learn more, Pastor. <laughs> but it was just a singular speaking engagement, so I let, left him a copy of my book. And I hope that uh, she, he started reading the book, okay? But that is really an experience of most men. It's very difficult sometimes to please a woman, right? How many struggle to please your wife? Ah, that's almost everybody, right? Anybody has a girlfriend right now? Can you raise your hands? Those with girlfriends, you don't want to be exposed, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes so un hard to understand why women can be so changeable. Uh, we often say they're fickle. It's only because we don't understand how they, how they work, how they operate, okay? But, uh, you know, sometimes we think women are just too emotional, you know. They take so many things personally. You know, I did not mean to, to intentionally hurt her by my words, but she took it in a different way. Now she's hurt, and I just can't understand that. 
you know? And the reason is because as men, we tend to look at uh, other people in terms of our own uh, experiences with ourselves as men. We tend to look at the world um, with a man's point of view. And we tend to expect women to think and behave like men. And there we are disappointed because they don't. They don't think and behave like men because they are women. And today, tonight we're going to see, you know, the distinctive design that God built into male and female when he created them. And when you begin to understand how God designed each one of us, especially how God designed the man and the woman, I think after this uh, night, you will have a greater understanding of your wife. And I believe that after you hear this lecture, the things you could not appreciate in your wife, somehow some of those things you're going to begin to appreciate. Okay? And you begin to understand the role of your wife in your life according to God's plan and purpose. So that is a promise, okay? And I trust God that he will bring it about in your lives. So let's take a look at our, okay? How to love a woman, understanding and meeting a woman's needs. In the story of creation, it's very important for us to understand design. You know, when you, you, you buy a, uh, a modern car with, you know, high technology, imagine buying a car with no steering wheel, everything is just push button. Futuristic car, okay? Uh, you know, Google has come out with their, uh, uh, you call that automatic cars, right? So, you know, you would want to be careful to read the manual, right? And understand how this car is designed in order to operate it correctly and secondly, to maximize its potentials, right? If you don't read the manual, you won't understand, you know, the, you know, the many functions of this futuristic car. And because you want to get your worth of your investment in the car, you want to be sure you're going to take advantage of all the features of this car, right? And of course, you have to read the manual. You have to understand the design and you have to understand how to operate it. And the same thing in human relationships. When we begin to understand God's design for man and woman, especially how women operate, it will help us understand better how to effectively relate with a woman. And so we start first with trying to understand God's design for man and woman. Just take a look at the story of creation in Genesis 2. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. There was a need, and God responded to that need. So the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in, east, in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed to work it and take care of it. So I want us to notice when God created the man, it was to meet a need. There was a need for a worker on the ground. And so God created the man from the dust of the ground to remind him of his function. The word Adam actually is the Hebrew word for taken from the word for ground. In Hebrew, ground is Adama. And so the man was named Adam because he was taken out of Adama, the ground. And Adam, man, was designed in order to work. So his primary orientation by God's design is to perform. That's why as men, we find our greatest fulfillment when we succeed in what we do. We hunger to succeed. We want to achieve because that's what gives us significance. That's what gives us our meaning as men. And when we experience failure, we feel we are not uh, you know, fulfilling our role as a man. We feel less than a man when we fail. And that's why because of that, the greatest struggle of all men is singularly the experience of failure. If there's one thing that scares us most of all, that is the idea of that we're going to be a failure, right? Because it militates against our design by God as performance-oriented beings, okay? And so let's take a look at God created the woman. In Genesis 2, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Notice, God created the man to meet a need. Now, God creates the woman also to meet a need. What is the need that God is, has meant the woman to fulfill in the man? The need for man to have a companion. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The word there, if you can see, the word helper in the Hebrew is the word ezer, which means a support system or a source of strength. Okay? So the woman was 
designed by God to be a source of strength, a support system for the man. Because the man as a performer, when experienced difficulties and failure, or even obstacles in his desire to be successful in what he does, he will ex definitely experience a lot of discouragement. And God designed the woman to be a support system for the man, to encourage him, to inspire him. And by the way, don't you worry, I share this with women, the wives, so that they understand their uh, design that for which God has created them. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Where did God took, take the material of the woman? From a bone, right? The rib, okay? And why do you think God took the woman from the rib Why God took the man from the ground, raw material? You see, man was created from raw material. The woman was created from refined material. That's why the Jewish rabbis who have been studying the Tanakh or the Torah for ages, you know, uh, said that, you know, the woman is the finest of all creation. Because whereas God created the man and the animals from the raw material of the ground, only the woman stands unique in all creation as the only being created from refined material. You understand that? Well, I usually respond whenever I remember that. It's true. Women is, the woman is the finest of all creation, and he also tends to be the refiner of the man, right? <laughs> I think for those who are married, you understand what I'm talking about. Our wives are always trying to refine us, right? <laughs> okay? So the woman was designed by God uniquely in all of creation. You know why? Because in the story of Genesis, the creation of the woman is placed in the context of a covenant-making ceremony. In ancient times, kings would make treaties with subjects, especially the conquered kings of foreign nations. And usually in the treaty or that covenant that is struck, the king, the benevolent king, will give a covenant gift to the subject to assure him of his commitment and the integrity of his uh, commitment to the covenant. So God established a covenant with the man according to the prophet to say in the garden when he gave him his word and after he gave that covenant, he gave the man the covenant gift. And that covenant gift was the woman. And God will never give a gift that is less than the best. That's why the woman is a very special piece of creation. Because God wanted to give the man the best. And we will understand very soon why and for what, you know, what is the design and purpose for the woman. Let's continue reading. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, the first giving away of the bride. This is where the practice is taken from. See, God did not say to them, come here, man, I've got a gift for you, come here and get it. No, he brought the woman, he escorted the woman, and gave her hand to the man. This is where the giving away in the wedding is taken from. The God acts as the father of the bride and now gives her to the man. And after he gives her to the man, this is what we read. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and they will become one flesh because the woman was taken from the man. When they're joined together sexually, they become one flesh in God's eyes. Okay? So that, this is how God designed the woman. So why did God create the woman? To meet the man's need for a companion, somebody just like him. That's why the word suitable in, in Hebrew means to measure up to perfectly to him as a man. And so while the man was created to be primarily a performance-oriented being, the woman was created essentially to be a relational being. She was designed for relationship primarily. Okay? That's why in our experience as men, you see, God's designed for the man, the worker, the creature of the soil, predominantly a performance-oriented being. We were taken for the soil, from the soil. God's designed for the woman, the lover, the creature of the heart. Because, by the way, the word helper in Hebrew, ezer, comes from a root word in Hebrew, which means to surround in order to protect. And now, where did God take the woman's material? From the rib that surrounds and protects the heart. You understand that, okay? So God is drawing an analogy here to the fact that the woman will be the bone of strength for the man in times of his emotional weakness, okay? And that's why you find here that the woman is the lover while the man is the worker, the creature of the heart, and predominantly a relational 
rationally oriented being. In Genesis 1.27, we see a further understanding of God's design for man and woman. Genesis 1.27, as you read, is the first piece of poetry in the entire Bible. This is the first poem, okay? And Hebrew poetry uses, usually follows a certain convention, and there's usually a parallelism between the lines. If you'll notice, I arranged the poem in such a way that you begin to see which is parallel to which. You notice there's a subject and a verb, subject and a verb, subject and a verb, God created, followed by the object, man, him, them. But you notice in the middle, in his own image, it's repeated in the next line, in the image of God. And what corresponds to the image of God, as we will see it here, male and female, corresponds to the image of God. In other words, the image of God is represented by male and female. Okay? One cannot be without the other. The male without the female does not completely represent the image of God on earth. It takes both of them to fully represent the image of God. For us to understand this, we find that in Genesis 1 and 2, there are two creation stories, by the way. Have you ever noticed that if you've been reading the Bible? In Genesis 1, there's a creation story. In Genesis 2, there's another creation story. It's like just a, another version of the same creation account. But we notice in Genesis 2, the story zooms in to the creation of the man and the woman, while Genesis 1 uh, actually shows us the macro the big, uh, the big version of creation where God creates the universe and lastly he creates the man and the woman. But in chapter 2, the story zooms in on how he created the man and the woman specifically. And so in Genesis 1, we see God depicted as a sovereign worker who works to meet the needs of creation. And so it started with the earth was formless and empty. And so in the first three days, God creates structures, sky, sea, and land. And then he said it was empty. The next three days, God creates content. He fills the sky with birds, the sea with fish, and then the land with animals and men. And so by the end of the six days, every need has been met. See, God works to meet the needs of creation. And so he creates the man, he designs the man like him as a worker to work in order to meet needs around him. That's why we were designed, to reflect that aspect of God as a worker who works to meet the needs of creation. That's why we cannot find any fulfillment as men if we are no, we're not able to meet the needs of our family and those entrusted to us, right? Especially if it's your wife earning all the income, you're not earning enough income. How do you feel? You feel good? How many enjoy that? My wife is earning all the income, paying all the bills, and I'm doing nothing. Does that make you feel filled as a man? Of course not. You know, it's, it just feel like a failure, right? Because we were designed by God to work in order to meet needs around us, particularly of beginning with our family. And that is a reflection of one dimension of God being revealed in the creation story. But when you go to chapter 2, God is depicted in an entirely different way. In Genesis 2, God is pictured as coming down to earth, personally molding man from the dust of the ground, and then personally breathing into him the breath of life. And then he takes him and puts him in his garden, and remember, the garden in the ancient times was a place of intimate fellowship for the king. So he puts man in the garden because he wanted to fellowship with the man. And after that, he sees the man's need for a companion, so he creates the woman. In chapter 2, God is being depicted as a deeply relational being. He is a God who seeks intimacy. He seeks fellowship with the man. He seeks fellowship with his creation. So in Genesis 2, God is depicted as the God of relationship. And when God designed the woman, he designed the woman like him to represent the relational dimension of his character. You understand this? So that man as the performer reflects God in Genesis 1. Man as the relator, a woman as the relator, reflects God in Genesis 2. So both of them reflect the performance and the relational dimension of God. Okay? So are you beginning to see that? Okay. As an essentially relational partner, the woman was created to complement and to complete the man, the performer. Listen to this. Women often criticize their husbands for their lack of sensitivity to relationships, right? Lack of attention to him, as your, to her as your wife. Lack of time with your children. You know, lack of time, you know, you don't even talk with, your, you know, with her mom or her parents. You know, the woman is always reminding us of one thing. The value of relationships, spending time, right, with family, 
How many of you agree with that? For those who are already married, right? It's all about relationships. And the reason why God created the woman is to complete us. We represent God's work side, working side, God's performance side. And we cannot be complete. We cannot fully reflect the image of God without the help of the woman because the woman's specialization is relational. It is the woman that God created the woman to balance the man, to help him understand the value, the equal value of relationships in rela relationships over performance. Remember the famous words of David McKay, no other success in life can compensate for failure in the home. When you fail in the most vital relationships of your life, no amount of material success can give you any genuine sense of fulfillment. True or false? And the woman was designed by God to constantly remind the man that we need to develop the relational dimension of our being as men. The woman is always there to remind us of that again and again to the point of becoming a nagger. Right? And, you know, as married men, we tend to resent that. We don't know the woman. I don't want to be feminized <laughs> by my wife. Right? And we'll soon see where that argument is coming from. Okay? When I allow my wife to remind me of the value of relationships, it is not that I am allowing her to feminize me. When I listen to my wife regarding matters of relationship, I am allowing her to fulfill her God-given role in my life in order to help me become the better man that God wants me to be. You understand that? Most husbands don't listen to their wives, especially when it comes to relational issues, right? Right? Because it's not performance stuff, you know. I want to work, I want to achieve, I want to do, right? I don't want to get into all these relational issues, you know, emotions, oh, you know. Well, there's one thing you're going to learn tonight. You cannot blame the woman for being who she is because God designed her that way. For a reason. To balance me as a man. And so when I listen to my wife, I'm allowing her to bring out the best in me as a man. Because that's her role in my life. I need to learn to be sensitive to the relational dimension of my life so I can become like Christ. And you will see that Jesus, the perfect model of manhood, was perfect both as a performer. You know what he said? It is finished. He finished the job. Mission accomplished. Achieved all the goals, right? It is finished, but listen to this. He was also perfect as a relational person. He gave his life for you and me. He said, no greater love has a man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. And while machismo seeks to repudiate, to try to reject all feminine qualities in a man, Jesus demonstrated so much of the feminine side, his compassion, his forgiveness, his grace towards those who offend him, his willingness to reach out down to the lowest, to be willing to be crucified for the sake of sinners. Everything he did was out of love and compassion, which are predominantly, from a machismo perspective, feminine qualities that we don't want to have as men. You understand that? Jesus was the epitome of perfect manhood. Perfect in performance, perfect in the relational. And as men, to become a real man, listen to this, from a biblical perspective, to become a real man, is to become like Christ. Remember that. Ed Cole, the founder of Christian Men's Network, who influenced the life of Coach McCartney. And Coach McCartney was used by God to start Promise Keepers in the USA. Ed Cole would often say, the reason why, you know, we as men, we need to become like Christ is because to be like Christ is to be the perfect man, the kind of man that we were meant to be. He always says this, manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. The more you become like Christ in, the, in his character, the more you become the real man that you were meant to be. You understand that? That's why as Christian believers, our desire is to become more like Christ in character because that's what leads us to real manhood. Jesus Christ 
is the model for all of us.